Welcome everyone, this is Pastor Bruce Brown at First Baptist Church of Las Vegas, Nevada. And we're glad to have you today as we continue our study in the book of Proverbs. We're uh, using a study called Explore the Bible uh, here at First Baptist Church. And uh, regardless whether you have that study in front of you or not, what you need is a Bible. Okay, and we're looking at the uh, Christian Standard Bible, uh, but we'll be in uh, Proverbs chapter 3 today, uh, verses 1 through 12. So as always, let's, let's begin in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you today uh, to seek your face, to understand exactly what it is you would have us do, what you're all about, uh, how we might shine your light in a world that uh, is struggling today. Lord, we pray that uh, we would open our minds and our hearts, uh, that uh, we might have a thirst uh, to understand exactly how it is you would have us live, and that we would uh, just walk alongside you. It would be evident that indeed we are believers in Jesus Christ, saved by grace, and just proclaiming the gospel. So Lord, use us today, use your word, bring them both together that we might please you. And all this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So we started out uh, last week and uh, we're reading from Solomon's writings and he's writing to his son. And uh, you may be familiar with the fact that uh, when Solomon became king, God asked him what he would like in order to be successful as a king. and. Uh, Solomon prayed, he asked for discernment, wisdom and discernment. And uh, the Proverbs, many of them, about 3,000 of the Proverbs are, are attributed to Solomon, to King Solomon. And uh, the, the wisdom writings is what they're frequently referred to. So this evening, I pray uh, that we'll get some wisdom together, okay? I think many of you are probably familiar with uh, GPS, uh, Global Positioning System, or, or God's Positioning System, I like to call it. Back in the day, uh, when I first uh, when we first got our car, it had a little screen on the dashboard for uh, GPS, and we kind of poo-pooed that because we thought that'd never catch on. Well, <laughs> little did we know that it would make quantum leaps in the upcoming years. So we bought this high-tech uh, piece of equipment. It was called a Garmin, and you could plug it into the lighter. That's when cars used to have cigarette lighters, and uh, you could put in your coordinates or your uh, where you wanted to go. And you can navigate, and we used it in Washington, D.C., and it looked and it worked really well. So you put the location or the destination in there, and it worked really well. It was based on trust, right, that uh, you would follow and go uh, where the GPS told you to go. And that worked great unless you didn't trust it or you think you knew a better way or you had a shortcut. And then you might wind up getting lost. So, again, it's about trust. And uh, sometimes it didn't lead you exactly where it should have, uh, maybe down a dead end road. They've gotten better now, I think, with drones and satellites flying around that uh, it's a little more accurate than it used to be. So that's kind of a, a real world application in terms of how we find our way. Today we use GPS, now we just get out our cell phones and, and speak and uh, give the location and ideally it guides us there. It tells us how many, how many miles it is, how long it will take us. And, and just in case you get lost, you know, we, we'll recalculate and tell you to take a U-turn safely, of course, at the next intersection. So Solomon here uh, in our study is going to give, give clear instructions about how to live wisely. And the instructions are useless, though, to the person who refuses to follow them. It's kind of like the GPS. If you choose not to follow it, there's no telling exactly where you may go. And it's the same thing that Solomon is going to teach us here, is that as you're following God's word and you surrender to that and you follow it, you'll reach your destination. So trust, trust in the Lord. Proverbs 3, verses 1 through 12. And as always, we're trying to give ourselves a little context here because we don't read every verse in our study. We were in chapter 1 last week and now we're in chapter 3. So Solomon taught his son to follow uh, the right path. And uh, this aligns well with Father's Day, I think. Here's a father talking to his son. And he encouraged his son to seek wisdom like an eager student who wanted to learn life's lessons and apply them in life. And ideally, that's what we're all about. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we're eager, we're anxious to learn. That's what we're gathering together now to study God's Word. He told him to seek wisdom, wisdom like it was a gift, like something he should really pursue, something of great value. Uh, from royalty and a treasure that had been hidden. If his son would seek wisdom, he would learn how to walk with God. So certainly, I, I believe that we all are striving, desiring the same thing. We want to walk with God, how we would do that to seek his wisdom. 
he would come to understand that God wanted to supply his people with wisdom. God wants us to understand him and his ways and that we would be compliant and obedient and do the things that he would have us do. In turn, he would be successful, safe, and secure. So Solomon's saying, son, if you do these things, you're going to be successful, you're going to be safe, and you're going to be secure. That's what we read in chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. So let's uh, start with a basic doctrine here that we're offered in our study, and it reads, it focuses here on education. The new birth opens all human faculties and creates a thirst for knowledge. So what is the new birth? That's when we're born again, born again in our faith, uh, born again believers in Jesus Christ. And when that happens, when we're brought by the power of the Holy Spirit, we have a thirst for knowledge. Um, one of our viewers, uh, we were blessed, he came uh, this past Sunday, and uh, through the studies, uh, he wanted to come and actually come to church, and he attended two services, and I tell you, that young man had a thirst for knowledge, so he fits right in here with our educational doctrine that we're looking at. So for God's people who are willing to follow him, and I want to emphasize willing, uh, it's a choice we make. It's pretty amazing that the creator of the universe, we still have to surrender and be willing to follow him. If we choose not to follow him uh, of our own free will, then we miss out on the benefits and the blessings. He gives us his direction. This involves filling our minds and our hearts with the Lord's instruction and then walking humbly in his ways, surrendering, and then we walk humbly. Humility in our walk with God shows up in our willingness to trust, trust his wisdom. We're humble. We trust what God is going to tell us. He's going to teach us. We honor him with our resources, and then we accept his discipline. Those are the things we're going to find or look at uh, as we study today. We're going to trust his wisdom, honor him with our resources, and accept his discipline. So let's begin with Proverbs 3 verses 1 through 4. My son, don't forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commands, for they will bring you many days of full life and well-being. And I emphasize here the word heart, but let your heart keep my commands. For generations, God's people had been directed to honor their parents. And this directive was one of the Ten Commandments. We find it in Exodus 20, 12, that God told children that they were to honor their parents. So Solomon echoed the significance of this commandment as he urged his son to remember his instruction. That is God honoring. That's what God has commanded his son to do. So he says, son, remember. Remember what God said, and you need to follow and listen to my instruction. However, Solomon didn't intend for his son to merely memorize uh, what Solomon was sharing with him. Just to memorize the words uh, that he heard his father teach him about wisdom. Solomon wanted his, his teachings to his son to be embedded in his son's heart. And it's a big difference uh, if we just memorize things for the sake, sake of being memorized just so we can recall them. Uh, he's saying here that God wants us to store uh, these commands in our hearts. And it enables us to put them into practice. In our hearts, our thoughts are fashioned into words and our intentions into actions. From our hearts flow our words when we respond, and so do our actions flow from our hearts. So Solomon's statement here about many days suggests that our days can be filled to the brim with what matters most in life if we're adhering to God's wisdom. When we take God's instruction to heart, he gives us a sense of his peace that gives us a full life and well-being. And I would emphasize again here about memorization. Perhaps many of you, uh, you've been students, whether it's been in high school or college, and you cram for a test, right? And you stuff all those facts in your mind and you memorize them. And uh, ideally, you don't go brain dead before you take the exam. And you take the exam and somebody asks you two weeks later what you learned and you can't remember anything <laughs> because you just were memorizing words. And here Solomon is talking about not doing that, that indeed these words are engraved in our hearts that we might act and uh, speak in a way that is in keeping with God's word. So we read on in Proverbs 3, 3, 4. Never let loyalty and faithfulness leave you. Tie them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart. Again, we're talking about the heart. Then you will find favor and high regard with God 
and people. And this is the second time last week uh, we saw, too, that uh, Solomon was referencing jewelry, how people would wear things and it would give evidence as to who they were. Uh, we wear different things. Sometimes I'll wear an American flag frequently uh, on my shirt. Even today, you probably can't see it, but I have a, I have a cross there. It signifies that I'm a Christian, and uh, it's a testimony. So Solomon is pointing that out to his son, that these attributes, you would wear them. They would be so evident in your life that people would recognize you uh, as a follower of God. So we're encouraged to nurture God's wisdom in our hearts by devoting uh devoting ourselves to loyalty. We're, who are you loyal to? Loyal to God, I pray. We're loyal to God because why? Because we love him. And we express our loyal love to him by the way we love others. It should be evident by the way we treat other people that we're Christians, that we're born again. How can you love that person? Well, I'm commanded to love that person. I love God. God calls me to love them. I'm loyal to God. Therefore, I will love that individual. As a result, his kindness flows from our hearts. When you're, you are indwelt by the power of the Holy Spirit, if you allow God to work, in, work through you, that love will express itself in your actions and in your, in your words. So Solomon's counsel to his son, it still resonates uh, with growing believers today. Ideally, you're you're, you're shaking your heads up and down and said, yeah, that makes sense. I, I get that. Or, hmm, I, maybe I uh, need to surrender a little more and allow God to use me uh, more than I have up to this point. When we put it to work in our lives, we become people of integrity. To live with integrity means to be the same person on the inside and on the outside. I'll think about that. Do we kind of put on a facade, perhaps? Sometimes maybe you have your church face and then you've got your uh, real face at work. There's a face at work. There's a face with your family. Ideally, what God is calling us to do in terms of integrity, that our inside should match our outside, okay? And on the inside, we have the Lord. God can see what's on the inside. Remember that. And that's uh, pretty convicting as well when you think about God knows your thoughts. He knows your motives. Sometimes perhaps you're saying things that you think might be advantageous uh, for you at work or you're trying to impress people. Maybe you're trying to impress a, a young lady uh, that you want her uh, to think you're, you're nice looking, handsome, uh, intelligent, and, and your motives uh, may not be purely driven uh, by your, your goal to be pleasing to God. So God can see what's on the inside and he looks favorably on the priority we place on keeping our hearts turned toward him and his wisdom. Is what we're doing pleasing to him? Uh, he can see our hearts. People around us can't see into our hearts. And uh, many times we're surprised by uh, people's actions. Uh, we may see them at church in one fashion, and then we may see them elsewhere, and they're behaving differently. And we're not quite sure what that's all about. Certainly God can see our hearts, and we don't, uh, we don't recognize that many times. And we need to realize that uh, even though we may be fooling some people with our behavior, God knows exactly uh, what our intentions are. However, we can listen or they can listen to our words and they can watch our actions and see that we live with integrity. Uh, do we, you know, we talk the talk, do we walk the walk? Uh, we teach our students in uh, high school, uh, integrity is doing the right thing when nobody's looking. Think about that, doing the right thing when nobody's looking. Uh, you're not trying to impress anybody, it's just the right thing. So let me ask you a question, if I may. Who stands out to you as a person of integrity? And uh, ideally, we'd have a little exchange on this, and I don't know who all uh, might come up. It could be your mom, your dad, a teacher, a coach, uh, perhaps your pastor. I don't know. Uh, but who stands out uh, to you as a person of integrity? And then how did you come to that conclusion about him or her? What, what were the qualifications that led you to think, yes, this person has integrity? I would think probably that they, they were truthful, they made good on their, on their promises, things like that, you trusted them. So Tol Solomon here, he continues to teach his son about integrity by bringing up trust. Trust and integrity, how they're related together. So again, we've looked uh, at a doctrine, let's take a look at a principle. God provides direction to those who place their trust in him. So when you trust God, he will provide you direction. There's that GPS example coming up again, right? You get your Bible out. Do you trust your Bible? So you read it. It gives you direction. If you trust the Bible, 
you trust what God is telling you, what? Then you will then you will do what God is calling you to do. So trust, we'll look at Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 8. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, and this is my favorite, I think, uh, life verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not, not, rely on your own understanding. In all your ways, know him, and he will make your path straight. And a, a couple things I would emphasize here, and you have different translations. Uh, first of all, trust in the Lord. Uh, he is our primary focus of trust. And then uh, you will read, for, for example, in the King's Dame, King James Version, it says, acknowledge him. And I really like in the Christian Standard here where it says, know him. Okay, And we talk about that uh, during uh, our salvation walk. And when people come to Christ, it's not just knowing about Jesus Christ, it's knowing him, having an intimate relationship. And that's what this, this verse really speaks to. Foolish people uh, place their faith in themselves and they count on their own wisdom. And we all do that, I'm sure, that we feel like I got this covered, I've had this experience before, and we rely on our own experience. Wise individuals know the value of placing their wholehearted trust in God alone. They depend on the wisdom that he gives them. And again, this is through God's word, uh, through prayer, perhaps through interaction with, with fellow believers. Gaining true wisdom requires us to know God. We must have that intimate relationship with him, not just know about him. Knowing him involves walking with him intimately, uh, sharing uh, your life with him openly, and devoting ourselves to him completely. It means acknowledging him as the sole source of the wisdom we need. He has all, all the wisdom, all the facts, all the answers that we could possibly need, and submitting ourselves to his direction without question. And again, that's, uh, that's quite a statement. Everything that God's word says, it's the inerrant word of God when we look to the Bible. And we accept it as the sole source of wisdom. We submit ourselves to his direction without question question. Trying to find our own way through the crooked places, as we look uh, through scripture and, and in our lives, it can be very difficult. I'm sure many of you may be navigating right now some crooked places, and it can be difficult to find our way. However, God's wisdom straightens out the paths for us so we can go in the right direction. Then Solomon goes on to write in Proverbs 3, 7, 8, don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. This will be healing for your body and strengthening for your bones. Isn't that an interesting uh, combination? Uh, that fear of the Lord will yield healing for your physical body as well as, as your spirit. So on our, our journey, pride can make us arrogant. Selfish pride can result from having been successful in the journey thus far. Uh, see, sometimes... Uh, some of the toughest folks perhaps to evangelize to are those that are really successful. Uh, they're financially successful. They have a lot of material possessions. They feel like they don't need God. They don't need the church. Maybe perhaps you've seen somebody even in your own church who has been uh, progressively successful in a material fashion and they no longer go to church anymore. anymore. So having some measure of success uh, can make us arrogant and persuade us to think we can be wise without God. Uh, that we can do things on our own and, re and really not rely on his word or, or his church. However, humble submission to him evaporates selfish pride and it drives arrogance away. When you're humble and you surrender before the Lord, that will drive that arrogance away. So walking with the Lord in humility and integrity has a positive impact on us. According to Solomon, it has a healing effect. An intimate relationship with God can refresh us with renewed health. We're refreshed as we allow the Lord to guide us through our journey of life. Trusting in the Lord to give us wisdom can have positive effect on our physical well-being as well as our spiritual growth. And again here, if you're stressed over uh, the crooked road, the challenges you're facing, uh, it's time to surrender anew uh, to God's word, uh, to look and see exactly what he tells us uh, as we see, reach out in prayer, as we look through our Bibles, uh, through our concordance, through the index, keywords, whatever it may be, as you're researching to find out what God would tell you. And what effect does it have on your physical well-being? Well, if you're stressed, uh, 
It can make you tired, it can make you angry, uh, it can hurt your sleep, uh, it can hurt your nutrition. And even beyond all those physical benefits that you get when you really surrender things to the Lord, you grow spiritually. Uh, your trust grows, you feel more confident in what God is doing, and uh, it's, it's just, it feels like a, a huge weight has been lift, lifted off your back when you really turn things over to the Lord and believe that he's got you and he's going to take care of things. Humility before the Lord continued to be a theme in Solomon's instructions to his son. Previously, Solomon showed how to express humility before God, depending on him alone for wisdom. So that was the expression of humility. I'm going to set myself aside and I'm going to depend on God for wisdom. So now Solomon moves on to show how we can display our humility and our walk with him by honoring him with our possessions. So we've surrendered in humility. Now we'll read on in Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. And this is what it says. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first produce of your entire harvest. Then your barns will be completely filled and your vats will overflow with new wine. And certainly this is an agricultural uh, example here to, uh, to the Israelites and they understand this, uh, it hit home with them as to exactly what God was saying to them. So let's see if we understand what God is saying to us through the scripture here. The people of Israel counted on their fields and their vineyards to produce what they needed. At harvest time, they gathered the crops that had been growing on the land. Now, who owned the land? They believed, and were to believe too, that God owned all the ground on which they planted their crops. Also, he provided them with the seeds, the rain, and the sunshine so the crops could grow well and the harvest could be plentiful. Because of his goodness to them, he deserved to be honored. All of those benefits, all those good things that had happened were a direct result of what God had done for them. And Solomon here is saying and refreshing our memories uh, from previously in, in, in the Old Testament that God deserved to be honored with their first produce. In Exodus 23, 19, God had commanded them to offer the first part of every harvest to him. So back in Exodus, uh, he's refreshing again their memories about what God had commanded them to do. He didn't suggest it, he commanded it. Their offering would be an act of worship that expressed their humility. They would affirm that their confidence re rested in him and not in the harvest they had gathered or the possessions that they collected. Regardless of the size of the harvest, they rested humbly in God's care. Solomon directed his son to understand that honoring the Lord with the harvest would not be a wasted effort. Through the act of giving the Lord the first of the harvest, God's people would learn he would honor them by blessing them. He would honor them by blessing them as they came humbly before him and gave him the first fruits. Solomon's promise about a bountiful harvest encourages believers today. When we honor the Lord with our possessions, we can rest assured that he honors us by providing for us. We can see for ourselves that he supplies us with everything we need. So let's, let's jump to the, to the New Testament here just for a moment and see the continuity of God's word here as Paul is writing uh, to the Philippians, the church at Philippi. And this is what he says. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. What's it about again? Trust God, come before him, know that he will provide for what? For your needs. It doesn't say your wants. You know, that new Lexus you want, those new tennis shoes, that new cell phone, that's not, that's not specifically what we're talking about here. That God will supply all your needs. Sometimes God's instructions to his people can be hard to take. Now, as you're listening to all this, maybe you're thinking, well, maybe, you know, this is I don't know that this applies to me necessarily. This sounds kind of tough. Uh, so it may be hard to take at least at first, but now Solomon's gonna go on and teach us how we need to accept this in Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. Do not despise the Lord's instruction, my son, and do not loathe his discipline. Well, those are some pretty heavy duty words, right? I don't know if you despise anything or loathe. I don't know how much you loathe anything, but uh, again, we're looking to God's word here. Let's, let's see what Solomon is trying to teach his son here. He says, I've given you some tough stuff you need to do. 
Make sure that you don't despise uh, what God is telling you to do or, or loathe his discipline. So, for instance, the instruction about honoring him with money and other resources may come across as difficult. We know how much pastors like to preach about tithing and offering. Not, okay? Uh, it can be a sensitive topic, but all we need to do here is go to Scripture, and we can see what God has to say about it. He's using Solomon here specifically uh, in the book of Proverbs. A believer who is facing financial difficulties may despise the notion that he or she has been instructed to give much-needed resources to the Lord. People are struggling, and they, well, don't really have a need to provide the first fruits to the Lord. I need to take care of myself because I don't trust God. Oh, we don't really say that out loud, do we? But we, we may think, think that internally. Uh, we're, we're compromising. Uh, we're justifying our behavior. The tough economic circumstances of some Christians could lead them to ignore God's clear instruction about giving altogether. Solomon knew his son would have difficulty with God's instruction at times. Many people today are struggling. Uh, they're unemployed. Uh, they're getting unemployment. Perhaps they're getting an additional uh, $600 a month. Perhaps they got a, a uh, federal stimulus check. And I know the first thing that came to everybody's mind was, gosh, the first part of each one of those blessings I should give to God. That should go to my church. I need to donate a portion of that to God. And that's what we're reading here. The first, and those blessings, did they come, I mean, uh, did they come from the federal government or did they come from God? And the answer is they came from God. So here, again, Solomon is trying to teach his son, and he's teaching us as well. He says his son might even loathe it. Approaching the Lord's instruction with scorn would not set a person on a path of godly wisdom. In other words, if you're questioning what God is saying, you, think, ah, you know, most of this Bible stuff I like, but there's some stuff, you know, that I just can't buy. If you're questioning it right away, you have a problem. You have an issue when you come before the Lord. Perhaps the, that's the reason Solomon referred to God's instruction here as discipline. We have to discipline ourselves to do what God teaches us to do. So becoming a disciplined person who is devoted to the Lord can be painful. Doing what God calls us to do. I can't find any place in Scripture where it says following the Lord is really easy. Following the Lord will always yield exactly what you anticipate. Uh, don't, don't see the, that in Scripture. Uh, through the ordeal, the discomfort, the stress and misery of being disciplined, Though it could, could be confused, we might even confuse it with punishment, you know, that, that God is punishing us for what we're, what we're doing. And not all discipline is punitive. It does not always involve punishment. Solomon's son needed to recognize that God was training. God was training him so he could become a disciplined believer. The way we get better at things is by practicing, okay, by reading and by doing. Here the Lord's discipline has been compared to what soldiers experience in boot camp. And I can speak to that. I went through basic training in the Air Force. And uh, the drill sergeant uh, in the Army, or DITI, we had training instructors. They're not trying to make our lives miserable. It may seem that way at the time. But they're not trying to make lives miserable each day because they need to be punished. They're not trying to punish you. Of course, their daily drills can be punishing. Uh, a lot of marching and running and, and jumping and obstacle courses and classes. But the reason for the drills has nothing to do with making them pay for something they did wrong. You're not being punished for something. Instead, the, the drill instructor is preparing. They're preparing the people for battle. And that's what God is doing. He is preparing us for battle as we read his word and as we comply with his word. As we're obedient, we grow stronger. Because they need to be prepared, the military, they need to be prepared for battle, and the drill sergeant trains them relentlessly. Constant, constant training, and it's the basic, basic stuff, okay? I remember still exactly how you had to fold your underwear, because it would be measured, and it would, you would be written up. If I had a tiny speck on my toothbrush, I got demerits, push-ups, running. And why is that? Because someday, that young man or young woman may be in charge of nuclear weapons. And they have to read a tech order. And it tells them exactly how to maintain that jet aircraft or when it is appropriate to launch that nuclear weapon. Now, those are pretty, pretty important instructions, right? 
So started with the basics and basic training. This is what your hair looks like. This is how you shine your shoes. This is how you wear your uniform. And it's not punishment. It's to prepare you for the jobs, the tasks that you will face in your life. So it's a, it's a great analogy to me as to what God is doing for us as well as he trains us, as he disciplines us. Proverbs 3.12. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, just as a father disciplines the son in whom he delights. So the discipline, again, is not punishment, it's training because we know that we're going to face challenges, whether it's with our children, uh, grandchildren, whomever, and here God, we are children of God, and he is disciplining us that we might be successful, that we might reflect him. Solomon's remark to his son give us a clue as to how God's discipline can be seen through the eyes of the believer who's enduring the pain of it, but it also helps us see the Lord's discipline from his unique perspective. According to Solomon, the Lord loves us. And that's why he sent his son. He sent his son to save us, because he loves us. And when we think about what's happening to us, we do well to start with the unshakable certainty of God's love. No matter what is happening in our life, how difficult it seems right now, the challenges perhaps seem unsurmountable. Never forget that God loves you. He sent his son. He gave his life for you. So, so that should give us assurance, it should give us hope, it should give us peace as we struggle with these earthly, fleshly uh, challenges, desires, trials that we face. And he doesn't always make us endure difficulty in order to punish us. Sometimes there are consequences to our sin. He allows us uh, to go through that. He takes us through tough ordeals because he intends for us to be disciplined Christians who can win the battles of spiritual warfare. If he didn't love us, he wouldn't care if we win or lose. He'd just let us run on our own. His love for us shows us shows in the way that he trains us to be victorious in battle. And during the training, you might get some bumps and bruises. You may have some scratches. You may get bumped on the head. But ultimately, uh, God's desire is that you succeed. Because of God's love for us, we can compare him to a father who adores his children. God is not cruel. He's not a cruel overseer who wants to make us hurt. Neither is he cold-hearted torturer who's eager to punish us, making us suffer. He is like a loving parent who cares enough about us to teach us so we can be stronger in our walk with him. Learning well may require us to face some difficult circumstances. We're wise when we face them with the certainty that God loves us. God is allowing these things to happen in our lives. He's with us. He's got our backs. We need to look to his word and, and move forward in a Christ-like manner. The confidence that God loves us like a caring father makes us even more grateful for the way Jesus taught us to pray. He instructed us to, go out, to call God, call God our father, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, Matthew 6, 9. Specifically, Jesus is teaching us to call God our Father. Knowing him as our Father helps us view ourselves as his children, the objects of his great delight, no matter what we have to endure in life. No matter what, God loves us. So, what have we learned today uh, from our study? Let's look at a quick recap, okay? First of all, in Proverbs 3, 1 through 4, Remember my teaching. You know, that's what Solomon is, is telling his son, and that's what God's telling us. Remember my teaching. In order to remember it, first of all, you got to read it, okay? And you have to believe it, okay? He goes on here. He says, trust in God alone. We need to trust in what God has written. Then we need to honor the Lord by being disciplined and doing what he has commanded us to do. And then we need to accept that instruction as our marching orders, okay? Regardless of the conflict or the, or the pushback we may receive. Indeed, we're called to trust in the Lord. Good lesson, isn't it? Uh, I encourage you to go back and uh, do some more study and uh, cross-referencing perhaps. Uh, we're going to be in Proverbs here for a couple months and move into the Song of Songs. So we're going to learn a lot. It is so applicable and certainly I believe it is as we're approaching Father's Day here. What a great, what a great combination. Uh, what a great lesson. So let's go, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we close here. Heavenly Father, uh, we celebrate the fact that uh, you've given us your word, uh, that we might study it, uh, that we might 
know more and more about you uh, as we delve in into the truths that you teach, uh, teach us. And again, Lord, we believe that this indeed is your inerrant word. You've inspired uh, men to write these things through the power of the Holy Spirit, that we might live a life that is pleasing to you, that we might glorify you, Lord. And in order to do the things that you've called us to do, the very first step is we must surrender to Jesus Christ and proclaim him as our Lord and Savior. We have to admit that we're sinners, we're imperfect. We need to come humbly before you and, and say, Lord, we can't get it done on our own. We aren't perfect. We need to recognize Jesus Christ as your son and that he walked among us and he taught us and he left us uh, his word. And indeed, you've augmented it with many, many people and many, many writings. But indeed, Jesus is the Son of God. And then we proclaim, we confess that Jesus is our Savior and Lord. And when we do those things, we're indwelt with the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what equips and enables us to do the things that we've learned today, that you have taught us. So, Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here uh, over the airwaves, uh, that this is the first time they've ever surrendered. Lord, I pray they would call me or send me a text or uh, an email, and let's uh, help them as a body of Christ take their next step in faith. And all this we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us. Look forward to seeing you next week as we continue in Proverbs. We'll be looking at Proverbs 3, verses 21 through 35. And everybody who agreed said, Amen. Bye-bye.